right off the back of this, we're going to go to our next panel here, uh, the role of digital health and social factors of maternal and infant health equity. Um, just bringing Lauren and Fran and Crystal on here from the uh, audience. In the meantime, uh, I think we'd love to get to uh, uh, know who you ladies are and um, we'd love to get a quick background uh, on yourselves before we start the panel off, I guess. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, by the way, it says that she's here and she can see. So would you mind seeing if um, Crystal could be switched over to the panelist role rather than the viewer role? That would be great. Sure, I'm having a look for it now. Um, thank you everyone so much for attending our panel discussion on the role of digital health and social factors on maternal and infant health equity. Um, so I am your moderator today. My name is Lauren Majors. I'm the co-founder and president here at Sonder Health, and I'm an international board certified lactation consultant. I have worked in the perinatal and healthcare IT space for over a decade with the last six years directly leading and managing a nationwide telemedicine practice for lactation and nutrition support. Um, joined with me today are an excellent panel of women who are doing amazing things in digital women's health, and I cannot wait for our discussion. Uh, for over 25 years, Fran Ayalasumayajala, Executive Healthcare Strategist and Technologist, has served the health needs of populations around the world. Fran is Chief Executive Officer of RTL Innovation. Uh, prior to RTL, Fran was the Global Health of Digital Health Strategies at HP, and she's worked on behalf of other major health and life science institutions, including the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Bristol Myers Squibb. Fran is a devoted volunteer and currently the president of REACH, a 501c3 global impact organization, and a board member of multiple industry-leading organizations, including the Consumer Technology Association Health Division and NHA of San Diego. Influencing global standards on health technology, Fran is the America's representative to the International Electrotechnical Commission, Segment 12 on Biodigital Convergence. She's also the author of several publications on a variety of digital health topics, including best practices for the successful adoption of virtual reality in the clinical setting, approaches to globally scaling AI and enabled and connected health technology solutions, and the deployment of digital health technology for the prevention of maternal mortality and morbidity. Crystal Morgan is a registered nurse specializing in labor and delivery, postpartum and newborn nursery care since 2003 after obtaining a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Purdue, from Purdue University. In her current role as an international board certified lactation consultant, she helps to implement lactation programs in her local hospital, providing education to patients, family members and staff and works with Sondra Health providing telehealth services for breastfeeding women and their families. In 2020, she completed her Master of Science as a family nurse practitioner, specializing in women's health and newborn care from Purdue University. She's committed to health promotion, disease prevention, and helping parents achieve their breastfeeding goals by providing evidence-based education and continued support. Thank you both for joining. And in fact, I think from um, that's a perfect segue into our conversation. So I'd like to begin today with starting with maternal and infant mortality in the United States. Um, we know that the United States has one of the highest rates of maternal mortality among industrialized nations with recent reports showing um, 20 deaths per 100,000 births in some populations like non-Hispanic black ethnicities showing a 2.5 times higher ratio. Um, it's interesting that a third of those deaths occur prenatally, over half, about 52% occur up to one year postpartum, and only 17% occur around the time of delivery. So I'd love to start and ask the question, why is it really important to look at maternal mortality across a continuum of time, rather than just at the time of birth and hospitalization, or only up until 42 days postpartum? Well, I guess I'll, I'll kick it off, Lauren, and first I'd like to say thank you so much for having me today, and thank you to the folks at HitLab. We're just really honored to be able to talk on this very important topic. Um, I think you said it very well, right, um, and the statistics that you presented, um, that um, often at times the, the continuum of care, it doesn't exist, and as a result of that, um, much further along the path of motherhood, what what we at REACH like to refer to as the tender moments of motherhood are when women are the most vulnerable 
Um, it's rather interesting that we spent a lot of time creating a, a birthing plan, um, but we don't spend a lot of time creating the postpartum <laughs> plan. And yet, as the statistics have shown, um, you know, that, that the criticality of the year um, following delivery is so, uh, so crucial. And yet it's the time in which um, the emphasis tends to be on the baby and not on the mother. And as a result of so, uh, shows up in the absence of the support services and even absence of support directly within communities in general. Um, and so we really do to need to do more to focus in on creating for that continuum. And an element of that is in creating coordination of care. Absolutely, fantastic points. Crystal, I'd love to hear from you. Well, again, hi, Fran. It's good to see you again. And Lauren, thanks for um, having me on as well. This is a great opportunity. Love to talk on a topic that I'm so passionate about every opportunity that I get. Um, I also think that what Fran mentioned, like the um, the plans, having all your birthing plans beforehand. I also on the lactation side, um, where it does get, it does seem like um, breastfeeding a lot of times can be geared towards the mother. I mean, towards the baby, but it also has a lot to do with the mother. So I've been trying to incorporate breastfeeding plans as well into birthing plans um, prenatally so that parents can know what to expect during their hospital stay, immediate postpartum, and until their breast milk is well established, up until they decide that they no longer want to breastfeed so that they can identify when things are going well and then when things aren't going so well and they can count kind of get out of the whole, well, this is normal, um, this is typical, and I'm just going to deal with it type of mentality. Um, they have been educated prenatally, so they know what to look for um, and when to identify and, and reach out for help. I think that that's so critical. Lauren, if you don't mind, I just want to jump in because one of the issues is, is that, okay, we're all here, right? And we're all well. And um, we've likely, many of us, you know, have had children. And if we think about our elders and their experiences with having children, what Crystal is talking about, a lactation plan, like, I would say, I never had, I never had that, but does that mean I didn't need it? Um, or to say that, well, I never had that and I was able to get on without it. And this is where I talk about, you know, the community really, even community and family not even showing up for women. And so, there are uh, institutional changes in mindset that need to transpire, and there are community uh, changes in mindset that need to transpire as well. And sometimes that's not so easy, but it's definitely what's going to be necessary to change the numbers that you recited. Mm -hmm. I love that you bring up the signs and symptoms and what you should look for and talking about it within a community-based approach. And a lot of times I'm asked the question, you know, why is it that, you know, we have so many women dying? What are they dying of? You know, we, we hear about things um, like high blood pressure, hemorrhaging, um, you know, mental health issues like overdose and suicide. Um, and when we take a community-based approach, I would just love to hear, you know, why do you think it's important to really take a holistic approach when we talk about screening and monitoring women before and after pregnancy? See, I think it's, oh, I, I'm so passionate about this topic specifically mm -hmm. right here. I think it is so important to take the holistic approach because a lot of times women, um, push off the emotional symptoms and they don't feel that those are signs or symptoms that they need to seek help for. Um, and then because those kind of take over, you lose focus on the actual physical symptoms that should prompt you to go and seek help, but you don't because your mental space, your mental capacity is in such a different, um, you're just in such a different headspace that you're not thinking properly. So again, it's like that prenatal, um, getting all that information from the beginning so that you know what's normal and what is not. And making sure um, once those high risk factors have been identified that patients are aware of the symptoms, um, that they can repeat them back to you, that they um, know what they're looking for, they understand the medications they're taking, why they're important to take them, um, and, and why to not just stop taking them. Um, so that's my... <laughs> 
I, I think you're spot on on that, Crystal. You know, um, at REACH, we did a uh, study. Over 900 women participated, and it. it was actually during um, the pandemic. In fact, we concluded the study in, um, in the spring of this year. And one of the questions that we asked about was in relation to their familiarity. And these were all pregnant women or are pregnant or new mothers. Um, and they were asked to tell their familiarity with uh, high, pregnancy and hypertension, anemia, gestational diabetes, with this long list. And over 60% of them had ticked off that they didn't know anything about anemia and they didn't know anything about high blood pressure, the dangers of high blood pressure in pregnancy. That's huge. Mm -hmm. That is huge. And, mm -hmm. and so it's really concerning um, that women don't have this information. We know that uh, over 80% of information that's relayed to patients is forgotten. Um, and that the, and the, of the information that's, um, that is, un, uh, is re, uh, retained, it's very little. 30% is actually retained. So that becomes a, a huge problem, which means we have to not only uh, tell them, tell once, we have to tell and tell and tell again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're in an environment where most, most people are in a, in a um, dual income household, right? Mm -hmm. And women are expected to go back to work policies that don't allow for women to have the ability. It's not a luxury. It's a necessity that women have the opportunity to heal, have the opportunity to bond with their child, and for the whole of the family to have the opportunity to go through the necessary changes that transpire when a new, a new person, a new individual is brought into the home. And that's just not happening sufficiently. And as a result, not only does it become a, a mental issue and, and physical issue, but it's just, it's, uh, it becomes a whole uh, family and so familial and societal challenge that we are facing and that we really need to have policies that support women uh, and, and encourage women to also breastfeed. You know, I think that's a fantastic a point. And when we talk about all of the information that women get, you know, sometimes uh, information is omitted, Sometimes information we hear over and over and over again. And when we talk about mortality rates, you know, we hear oftentimes about sudden infant death syndrome and SIDS. And so when we shift to talking about infant mortality rates, you know, I'd love to talk about this in the context of breastfeeding and infant feeding. And I think this is really important because oftentimes this tends to be overlooked in the whole, you know, perinatal continuum. Um, just a couple of statistics, you know, when, when babies receive human milk, um, the risk of sudden infant death syndrome is reduced by almost 50%. Um, unfortunately, there's only uh, about 25% of women that initiate breastfeeding reach current recommendations for breastfeeding in the United States. Um, and those that have high risk pregnancies, about 30% of those have lower odds of exclusively breastfeeding. So if we were to turn that on its head and look at it in a different way, you know, if we were to have optimal breastfeeding, we would save over 2,000 maternal deaths every year, 500 infant deaths, and over a billion dollars in healthcare costs. So mm -hmm. when, we, when we talk about the entire continuum, I'd love to hear a little bit more, you know, why are lactation professionals in particular important in this immediate postpartum period? I feel like uh, lactation is that important immediate postpartum because those are what's going to be happening um, during that time is what they will seek out help for. So if you have that lactation consultant, they can at least be the middleman and identify some of the postpartum problems that might be occurring that are being missed and kind of um, send mom on the right direction of who she needs to reach out to, um, reviewing those symptoms, um, the emergency postpartum symptoms and when to contact someone when they need um, when they need further assistance. I also think that it's another opportunity for us to repeat some of the things that they might have missed um, during their hospital stay. I know working in the hospital um, still as, as well as working um, 
for Saunders through telehealth. Um, I am seeing that a lot of patients are going home within 24 hours of delivery um, because of COVID. So that is another culture that's kind of turning over and I don't really see that going backwards. Um, so it is really crucial now because um, just like Fran said, things are missed when you're giving discharge instructions or when you're educating patients. So cutting a day or two for even our C-section moms, um, 24 hours is no time at all to review your signs and symptoms, to make sure your baby's eating well, um, to make sure you understand what's going on with your care. Um, so that initial contact with your lactation consultant after delivery can be key to making sure that you stay on the right path postpartum. You're so spot on. I, you know, let's be real here, okay? The amount of days in the hospital were decreasing before the pandemic. <laughs> they absolutely, they absolutely right? were. They absolutely were. <laughs> they were decreasing before the pandemic. So it's like, it's no surprise we're now at 24 and that for many, it may very well stay at that. And I, and as you know, Crystal, you were saying like having um, that relationship with a lactation specialist is a key one. For all of those reasons, and because there are certain roles that different professionals and specialists play within the continuum of care. Mm -hmm. And so the likely, you're not gonna have that conversation with your, uh, with your obstetrician, right? You're now no longer, up, you're no longer in the category of obstetric, right? The baby's out, you're on, you're back. To, you're lucky if you're back to your gynecologist and having a, a follow-up there, right? right. Um, and even getting women in to make sure that they're getting that, that follow-up and knowing that that's not sufficient. And then the time factor, you know, I was uh, on another a panel which we were talking about the average amount of time and one of the um, one of the uh, panelists had commented that he had 15 to 20 minutes with his clinician. I was like, well, you're lucky because the average <laughs> is seven, <laughs> it's seven yeah. right? So the fact that a lactation specialist is, is there to have the conversations that you've just described and can, and can afford the time to devote to a mother is really critical. And it doesn't just begin and end there, right? Mm -hmm. That individual is there to continue to provide that support for as long as the mother needs. And that's, that makes for a very unique occupation and, and a very uh, vital role in the support of a mother long-term. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I tell people all the time, um, as a lactation consultant, I may be one of the first people that that patient sees as soon as they get home. And so when you talk about those red flags or those warning signs, you know, I've got a headache, I've got excessive bleeding, you know, things connected to sepsis or babies, babies go downhill really quickly. Um, it, it's a little known fact and it should be um, much more widely known, but about 40.9% of all of the neonatal hospital readmissions are due to infant feeding problems. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about jaundice or low weight gain or dehydration, again, um, we may be some of the first to identify that and be able to start that process of care coordination or getting, you know, saying, hey, this is a sign and symptom, or you might be second guessing yourself, but I want to confirm that this is not normal. We need to take action on this now. Um, I'll take a great example. Last week was Thanksgiving and, you know, physicians go on Thanksgiving and holiday too. And so um, I saw a baby that was just not doing well and their appointment that they typically would have seen, you know, after discharge was postponed by a week simply because of Thanksgiving. Um, so we started that process. We were able to identify, you know, this very seriously could have easily been a neonatal hospital readmission. And so I think just having um, a, a resource that's clinically trained, um, there's so much value in having peer support around to help give that encouragement, but there's also this real value of having somebody trained in the clinical management of lactation that can help with those high-risk cases. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to know, because it sounds like we're talking a lot about, you know, there's gaps. I, I hear the common phrase that women in the postpartum period are treated kind of like a hot potato. They mm -hmm. go from writer to provider, they go from clinic to clinic, um, and there's these gaps that exist. And, you know, when you leave the hospital, it's gone from now one patient to now we have two patients. So mm -hmm. how do you see digital health really helping to stand in the gap around a lot of the conversation that we've been having today? 
Mm -hmm. I love the digital platform personally. Um, I have helped so many patients through um, Sonder Health and being able to see patients so quickly after they go home that it just makes my heart happy. And I wish more people had these tools and services. Um, number one, they're in their own home. So a lot of times they're a lot more comfortable just being in their own space as far as talking and being open and honest and just being comfortable in general. It also allows an opportunity for their support system to be present. You don't typically pack up everybody and bring them to the office with you. Um, but I have had many of uh, consults recently with dad, a mother-in-law, a mother, um, sisters, mm -hmm. aunts, um, every, older siblings. Um, they have been in the mix. And I think it's important to include the support system because when you aren't there, those are the people who are. And if that mom feels supported and everybody's on the same page, then it makes her outcome even greater. Um, so telehealth has allowed that um, tremendously. Um, and then it also allows moms the opportunity to feel like they can continue to seek the help. So if they aren't up for, um, driving to the office or packing up their younger kids and taking them with, they're still able to get their questions answered. Um, to talk. I, I had a whole consult with a mom today, breastfeeding twins, and I consulted with her on her errands. We went through Walmart <laughs> we went, because that is, she said, I'm, I have two month old twins, but I have a 14 year old son. I have to pick him up for this appointment. We have basketball. I, this is the only way to fit it in. Now what, uh, and she had legitimate issues and she needed legitimate help and I was able to give that to her. But what other platform allows you to do that? That's, I love that example. It's a very uh, valid one. And um, our data at REACH has shown that over 80% of women uh, are interested in using digital health technology, but that um, less than 20% have actually ever engaged with it which means there's a huge uh, opportunity there. Um, during the pandemic, uh, back in May of last year, sort of the, the height, if you will, of all of the unknowns of, of COVID, we had interviewed with, um, with specialists, with predominantly obstetricians, gynecologists, and midwives. And even amongst that group, um, we had found that many were very much interested in the technology, but they weren't trained on it. They, weren't, they didn't have a, a path for reimbursement. Um, and that was a challenge. Separately from that, we've conducted studies that had shown that many physicians, and in fact, Ipsos Mori's research that called the Digital Doctor Survey, had indicated that over 50% of clinicians had to fend for themselves when it came to the utilization of the technology. So, I, you know, what I adore is how crystal, you were actually crystal clear in some of the examples, <laughs> right? Some of the ways that it's a benefit to the, the, the mother, the family, as well as the, yourself as a clinician. Uh, and what we really have to do more in terms of institutions appreciating the value that it brings and, and recognizing um, as much as it helps in terms of the census and the well being of individuals, the financial impact and gains. That are uh, that you know are proven when we uh, utilize these technologies uh, in all of the ways that Lauren you had described in terms of um, being able to reduce uh, complications. For example, we know that preeclampsic patients cost three three times as much as a normal pregnancy um, when that when it is not controlled, right? When it's presented and uncontrolled. But we know with other studies that Reach has been involved in that we've been able to reduce hospitalization by 88% when remote patient monitoring technology is applied and help to support women with preeclampsia. So there's a lot of opportunity. And I think that hearing more stories from uh, individuals like yourself is like just the thing that we need to keep putting in front of, of those leaders within institutions to start accommodating for a technology that really serves the benefit um, benefit families, but also benefit their bottom line. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's more than one way to use technology. You can get very creative and you can get to um, accurate evidence-based 
diagnoses faster. You know, you can use a combination of video, you can use store and forward. You know, I think about flowcharts, you know, in our instance, you know, we use flowcharts very frequently to track babies' weights, to track feeds. You know, that information can be bi-directional and can be a constant um, conversation or communication. When I think about weight gain and, you know, preeclampsia, you know, that information can come back into the system. Um, there's lots of creative ways, but you, you're so right, Fran, in the sense that um, it creates different workflows. And so um, clinicians need to be trained. Um, those, those workflows need to be identified and then proper reimbursement models need to be a sustainable solution for them. Um, I, I, in the last couple of minutes, I wanna just take some time and do some myth busting around some barriers, inequities in digital health. So, so what are, you know, just one or two common myths that you see and that you would say something, you know, entirely different than what we typically hear. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, as it refers to lactation, as it refers to digital health and, and barriers. Mm -hmm. um, barriers. Well, while you're thinking about it, I'll just kind of rattle off, you know, a, a couple of them from my perspective. I mean, one thing is to, to note that, um, I think it begins with what Lauren, you were talking about in terms of there's, you know, there's no one, one size fits all method. Yeah. So if you're thinking that it's an all or nothing, that's, you know, that's a fallacy, right? Uh, many of the models are, are actually hybrid models, which are a combination of synchronous and asynchronous, and that's what creates for the success in them. Um, mm -hmm. Also that the technology, uh, you know, stands on their, on its own, or that, or that individuals can't find communities in online environments. That's another fallacy. We know that in fact, particularly amongst uh, pregnant and um, mothers and, 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 and new moms, excuse me, uh, pregnant women and new moms that they're seeking um, reliable sources of information. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the first place that like anyone else that they go to is in the online environment. And so that, that just is a big indicator of the power of the technology. Um, and, and the third one I'll just add is, a, is around um, the opportunity for uh, revenue, um, you know, re revenue benefits for for um, provider institutions, that there are models that have been proven very successful and very lucrative for facilities. We know that there's no money, no mission. So we might as well just be open and honest about the fact that many of these institutions have been hesitant because they have struggled in recognizing the ways in which it could possibly impact their bottom line. Um, but I think that we have uh, already kind of talked through some ways in which it, indeed it can benefit them as well as benefit our economy when women are um, when women are well and able to be able to more actively uh, participate in the economy as they typically would do. Fantastic, fantastic. I guess one of the biggest myths for me would probably come from the clinical side um, mm -hmm. in the sense that a lot of people don't feel like you can be as thorough with digital health. And I like to use it um, to do quite the opposite where you can teach the patient more hands-on things. Like we have had to get very creative with assessments. So a lot of times we've ended up turning our consult into learning how to take your blood pressure cuff or how to use your blood pressure cuff. Um, doing a temperatures on babies, um, doing oral assessments on babies. Like we've, we've had to get very creative with that. And I think it teaches parents and their families, their support systems, a whole nother set of skills that they wouldn't necessarily get if they were going to someone in person where they have a 15 or 20 minute, um, 10 minute time slot to fill. Absolutely. Mm. Fantastic conversation. Uh, we could talk about this for hours. There's okay. so much to cover. Thank you so much um, for your information, for the passion, the ways in which you're changing and innovating in digital women's health. Thank you for everyone who joined us today. Um, please feel free to reach out to one of us if you'd like to continue the conversation and to connect more.